Amen. As a pastor, I have the honor uh, from time to time of officiating weddings. I love being able to officiate weddings. Every wedding is, is different, and I'm curious, uh, anyone in the room that I officiated your wedding? Do we have any? We had a, one in the first service, none today. Okay, well, if we need to have a talk, we've got one coming up perhaps. Um, they, they actually are engaged right here. So uh, we have to have, I, met, I told Abby this morning, I need to text her, we've got to get those details going, we've got to talk about all that. Pastor business. One thing I've noticed, weddings continue to change, the ceremony changes. Chelsea and I got married in 2007, 7707, so neither of us would ever forget the date because both husbands and wives are equally prone to forget a date, I'm sure. Um, but a lot has changed, and as I officiate weddings, I see more and more of all the changes taking place in the ceremony. So in 2007, um, we didn't have social media to any degree. We didn't have Pinterest. We didn't have, you know, there's just nothing. So you just sit down with the pastor and he says, here is what you will do for your wedding. And then we said, okay. And if you were maybe got married in that date or earlier, you know, there wasn't as much. There's so many things you can do now. You can choose to do different things. One of the things I've done in a number of weddings recently has to do with this. Uh, it's a symbolic act of showing the unity taking place. If in 2007, when Chelsea and I got married, we had a unity candle. And if, is anyone familiar with the unity candle? Okay. <clears throat> the unity candle, you have three candles, if you're unfamiliar, and, and one represents the, the bride's family, one candle represents the groom's family, and then the candle in the middle represents the new family union, the new marriage taking place. And so I think, mom, did you light, did you take the candle? Did you, were you there? You were there. You don't remember. Uh, reception went a little crazy for mom, so she doesn't know. We'll watch the video and find it. I'm kidding, mom. We're having fun today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, someone lit the first candle on behalf of our family. I think it was, was mom, and then Chelsea's mother lit the other candle, and then they took them together, and they lit this new candle symbolizing this. There's a new family. There's a new union taking place, and that's a, a really neat thing, and, um, and so I, we, we have that candle. We had that candle, I should say. We put it in a box somewhere, and we were encouraged by people to take that out a year, uh, you know, on your anniversary and light that, and, and you know, just think about your uh, think about your wedding, think about all that has happened in a year, things like that. Same idea to the people who say you should take some of your wedding cake and freeze it for a year and then eat it. This is the thing people told us. This is the thing, right? That, was, that sounds disgusting then. I think it's disgusting now. <laughs> and we, we put it in the freezer. I remember this in our first apartment. And a year later, I think we, we didn't even remember it on the anniversary, but we took it out you know, behind microwave meals and ground beef hey, it's in this little box, and we looked at it, we put it right in the trash. It just looked gross, all freezer burned and stuff, okay? So we're super romantic, yeah, like that. We thought, I remember one time we were, we were moving or something, we found our candle in, in a box. We, oh, our, our unity candle, our marriage stuff, and we pull out the unity candle, and that'd be kind of, and it had actually melted, not down, like, but just being in a hot attic, it had completely melted into a puddle. So we have a unity puddle <laughs> that we can't light, so we threw that in the trash with the cake, and, and we're still kicking. How many years later? We're doing okay. So do whatever you want with your wedding uh, memorabilia. But I, but I mentioned those things, the, the unity candle, because I've seen people do more and more really creative things. One I've seen, and maybe you've done this, is sand. They use two different glass jars of different colored, one color and the other color, sand. And during this unity moment, the bride will pour some, and the groom will pour some, and they'll go back and forth, and they'll create this in a new glass jar, kind of this beautiful mixture of two colors of sand. And, and, and then what the officiant normally says is, you know, uh, just as it would be impossible to now take this, these two colors of sand and, and put them back in, so too should it be impossible for this marriage to ever dissolve. And we, we pray that blessing over the, the couple. Uh, I've seen another couple who decided to plant uh, something. They either repotted uh, a, a small, like a, like a sapling of a tree or a flower, a lily, but they took soil from one of the families, the, the, the groom's family's property, and then also soil from the other family's property and put it together in a new pot, and they put that together or planted a seed and things like that. I thought, what a creative way to do it. Um, 
Now, the other one that I've seen <clears throat> that I just love, and I've seen this one the most, is, is the unity rope or the, the cord of three strands. Maybe you've seen this. There's like a, like a board like, that you could hang up a, a frame, and in it there are three cords. And, and, and during that moment, uh, the officiant will, will talk a little bit about uh, the passage we're going to read today, which is from Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And it ends with this phrase, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. And so we're going to read this in a moment, but, but the secret I want to say, and why I'm beginning talking about weddings today, um, Joe Pastor was, you know, some of you know Joe and Beth Pastor, they were in the first service. I did officiate their wedding, and they had the unity rope as part of their ceremony. Did anyone else do the unity rope? Have you ever seen it before? Anyone do it or have seen it? Maybe this is a couple. Okay, I think more people have done this one. When I, I mentioned it to Joe, he was sitting over here, and I said, Joe, just so you know, um, I read that verse you guys did the unity rope, and I said that the secret, though, the pastor's secret is that this verse that we're about to read has nothing to do with marriage. <laughs> and he said, oh, good. I said, your marriage is fine. Don't worry. It doesn't, doesn't, you know, negate anything. It's still official in the state of Indiana in the eyes of God and all this. But the passage we're going to read is not about primarily marriage. But I think I've shared this passage at almost every wedding I've ever officiated because although it's not written directly about marriage, it certainly applies to marriage. So Ecclesiastes, small book near the middle of your Bible, chapter 4. The words will be on the screen as well if you want to follow along. I'm going to read verses 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Beautiful, inspiring, true, but not necessarily about marriage at all. This verse is about relationship. Title of today's message is simply life together, an all-encompassing term for maybe the different relationships in this room. We have friends, we have people who have been in a small group together. Uh, maybe you've met someone, you, you've become, you used to just be people attending the church, but now you've become good friends. You share meals together, you, your kids play sports together, things like that. Doing life together, being uh, my life interwoven with yours, interwoven with someone else where we know each other. That's what today's message is about. Last Sunday when I was sharing a little bit about community groups, I shared a passage from Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And in this passage, uh, this takes place near the end of the creation account. We read about God's creation. He's creating everything. Um, and in this, when this verse comes up in, in verse 18, God has already brought into existence light and, and, and dark. He's brought in land and water and animals and plants and all these things. And uh, through Genesis 1, God creates something specific, and then he declares that thing that he's created good. He says, I've created this, and the Lord saw it, and it was good. And he creates this rhythm that he creates, and he declares it good, and he creates, and he declares it good. But here in Genesis 2, 18, something different takes place, because at this point, he has moved to his, uh, his masterpiece. The only thing thus far that he's created that isn't just coming out of his creativity but it's coming out of his very image. His very essence is baked into this part of creation in a way that none of the other creation holds. We are made in the image of God. And in this moment, he's created the man. And at this point, this is the, the peak of everything he's created. But something else was created unintentionally in this moment because God looks in and he says, it is not good for man to be alone. So what was once his crowning achievement was this man solitary and alone gets pushed aside so he can bring forth the actual crowning achievement, creative moment, not just the woman, but the relationship, togetherness, doing life together, one and another coming together. And yes, this has a uh, implications for marriage, dating, engagement, certainly, but it also has implications for the rest of life, that it is not good for mankind to be alone. 
Now, this is because uh, what would have caused God to look into this, um, into this moment and say, well, that's, that's not good. Why, why is it not good? Um, because think of what the man had. He had everything he needed for life. He had a relationship with God. They were together. He had given him the entire world as his kingdom. God could have been done. And, and if God wanted to create other people, it's not just a procreation issue. He, he could have set up other kingdoms with other individuals. God could have done whatever he wanted. But he looked into and saw isolation, a solitary man, disconnected from anyone else, and said, that is what is not good. God saw the lack of relationship and called that not good. And God knew that the lack of relationship was not good because God, for eternity, has always, is, and will always exist in relationship. I don't know if you've, you've known this or not. Um, there's a word that we talk about in church, in the Christian world, the Trinity. Have you heard of the Trinity? But you're not going to find that word in the Bible. But the Trinity is composed of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One of the most mysterious parts of our faith. And if you can explain it, I bet you're wrong. I'll be honest. This is, you can try, you can swing, you can try to take a, a swing at this one and explain it. But, but it's going to defy because our finite brains cannot fully describe an infinite God Three persons in one. We just can't do it. And we see this in Genesis 1.26, that God has always existed in relationship. So God was familiar with relationship. So when he looked at man and saw him alone, these warning bells went off. God knew the power of relationship and saw that relationship was absent in the man's life. Look at this passage here, and you can see a reference. There's actually four references in the Genesis account to the Trinity without ever using that word. But just the simple language here in verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image. It's plural, not let me do this. I should do this. Let us. There's relationship on display from the very beginning. Now, I said it's mysterious, but it doesn't mean we can't try to grasp the Trinity, the relationship there. There's a slide here with a diagram, if you can pull that up. A, a crude drawing, but I think it's simple enough that it might be helpful. On the top, we have God, we have the Father. The, the bottom left, we have the Son. Bottom right, we have the Holy Spirit. And you can see the lines on the outside. Let's start with the Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. Okay, so there are three unique, separate persons. Now, here's where it gets mysterious. Because at the same time that they are all not each other, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and the Son is God. So you got, it makes sense now? No, not at all. But that's okay. It's okay. You do not have to be able to totally comprehend this. And honestly, if you could comprehend God, what value is there in following that God? That's, a, that's an idea, that's a concept, but we don't serve ideas and concepts. We serve God, and God is infinite in his existence, but in that existence from the very, very beginning, we see him in relationship. God has existed for eternity in relationship, and because we are his children, we are made in his image we have a desire in our lives for relationship, for connection, for doing life with others as well. Community is a word we use all, often. This is a community. There's a community of believers in this room right now. There was a community of believers in the first service, which you are also a part of. Uh, you just all slept in, which is fine. It's okay. They got up earlier. The Holy Spirit was, was here early, and, and, and you get what's left. But... Um, no, no, no. God is omnipresent. God is here. God is omnipotent and God is powerful. And so in this community where God is at, we are also here with one another. But let me say this. Being in uh, this room or attending church is not the same as being a part of a community. Because it is very easy, even in this room, even knowing that we've been designed for relationship, God pulls us and invites us to do life with other believers it's very easy to tell ourselves we are part of a community when, in fact, we are only 
peripherally connected to that community. What I mean by that is this. You could have attended this church every Sunday for the last eight years and yet still not know a single name and still not have given your name to anyone else. Just because you're in the room doesn't mean you're part of the community. Now, the invitation is open, but there's some responsibility on us to step into this community. See, God's intention for God's people is that we would live in and experience God's community. This is not accidental. It doesn't happen um, uh, by chance or by accident. It's something that we have been invited into, but yet we have the responsibility to walk into ourselves. Community of relationship is not just being near others, but doing life with others. Being in the room is great. It it can give you the, the flavor, the scent, the idea of the community, but that's different than being in life with other people. One of the ideas I mentioned last week is that throughout the New Testament, there are 58 or 59, depending on how you count, commands regarding the one anothering that the early church was known for. There's a few of them on the screen right there. These are things that you cannot do in isolation, that you need other people around you, that you need interactions with people so that you can fulfill these things. And these things on the screen, these are not suggestions. Let's start the first one here. Be devoted to one another. This is not be devoted if you happen to get to know people and then you feel comfortable enough that that devotion feels natural, then then go do that thing. Love one another if you get to the point in the relationship where you trust and you both know each other's names and you know the people in the group. And if you want to, then to do it. Now, these are much more direct commands, right? Love one another. Accept one another. Serve one another. Be patient with one another. Forgive one another. Submit to one another. Encourage one another and 50 plus more throughout the New Testament. With this in mind, I want to propose to you this morning that no matter how much you read the Bible, and I hope that you just devour the Bible. I hope you find time to read the Bible because it's God's word to us. But no matter how much you read the Bible, no matter how much you pray, and I hope you pray because time in prayer is never time wasted. Time in prayer with God is time spent becoming more Christ-like. So I hope you pray. I hope you read the word. I hope you pray. No matter how generous you are, and I hope you're generous because there is great joy in generosity. But, but no matter how much you engage in any of these activities or other spiritual disciplines that we're going to be talking about in some weeks coming up, you and I cannot fulfill God's plan for our lives if we pursue that plan alone. Let me say that again. No matter how you engage In your Christian walk, no matter how you grow, no matter how you learn, you cannot fulfill God's plan for your life if you pursue that plan alone. Because you have been designed not to do life alone, but to be in relationship with other people. Why can't we do this? Why can't we do life alone? Well, let me go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 4 where we'll spend the rest of our time. Life together is greater than life alone in God's kingdom. Now, this is an invitation. It's a command and an invitation. But again, you have autonomy to do whatever you want. You have autonomy to accept that, that life together is greater than life alone. Or you have the autonomy to reject that and to go your own way. My job today is to hopefully encourage you to prayerfully consider what it would look like to move in the direction of community. So four thoughts, and then maybe a fifth if we have enough time, a little little bonus at the end. Uh, Four reasons why we can't do life alone. Impact, help, comfort, and strength. Impact, verse 9 says this, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. This just seems kind of like a logical statement, nice, easy proverb type wisdom literature. Loosely translated, we often attribute the following to Aristotle to quote a a pretty big heavy hitter. Uh, The whole is often greater than the sum of its parts. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. What this means broken down to a degree is that um, anything that's made up of different parts, each of those parts has to have a value. It might be a great value. It might be a small value. If you drove a vehicle to church today, it's made of thousands of parts. 
every one of those parts, when it was assembled on, a, on, on an assembly line, had a cost attached to it. Every rivet and bolt and screw, every wheel and hubcap, everything in your car has value. But when they all come together, the car assembled is worth more than just a few thousand pieces of plastic and metal and rubber all in a big pile, right? Maybe more simply, a cookie. <laughs> Maybe four ingredients-ish. I had to Google that because I don't make a lot of cookies. My son has been baking for us lately, made some delicious cookies last week, loved them. Uh, flour, sugar, butter, egg. Are we getting close to a cookie there? We're pretty close, right? We, we mix, mix those things up in the correct proportions for the correct amount of time at the correct temperature, and you're going to come out with a cookie. Now, cookies are, are wonderful. Um, love cookies. But those ingredients, I, I know you normally when you make a cookie, you make a dozen, you make two dozen, something like that. But if you could just make one cookie, I said, I need you to make one cookie. That's it. One cookie, normal size. And you broke down, you need this much flour and this much sugar and this much butter and this much of an egg. I don't know how to do that one, but figure it out. <laughs> and you put those in four little dishes in front of you. Each of those dishes con contains something of value, right? It, it might be a penny. It might be a fraction of a penny. But the flour is worth something. The, the egg is worth something. The sugar, the butter, they're all worth something. But I'm not going to pay you for those four things separately. But I would pay a great deal of money for the completed project, the cookie. Uh, there are two new cookie places in Fort Wayne that we have uh, hit frequently. Uh, crumble cookie, delicious. Uh, 6,000 calories per cookie, so just <laughs> careful. Uh, if you do a community group, maybe you can just share a cookie with your community group once a year and not die. Um, the other one is called Dirty Dough. I know, it sounds kind of weird. Holden said, I want to go to Dirty Dough, and I said, you will not. We are a pastor's family. And we will not go to Dirty Dough. I don't know what that is. And he said, it's a place that serves warm cookies with more cookies stuffed inside. I said, we'll absolutely go to Dirty Dough. Let's go. <laughs> we'll go to Dirty Dough. And, and they're delicious. They're, they're good. But, but break down the ingredients. They're, they're, they're not worthless. They have value, but they're worth more together. The sum or the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And, and though the illustration breaks down, it's not a one-to-one -one translation here. It's the same is true with our lives, right? We all have gifts. We all have things we can do. Every person in this room brings something unique to the table. Your experience, your skills, your testimony, your childhood, your passions, even your fears, your achievements, the things you've done in life are, are wonderful. But together, we can do more than you could ever do alone. We can build something beautiful when we come together. And you can build something on your own as well, but it'll pale in comparison to what a community can build when we bring those gifts, put them together, and go, okay, what now are we working with? Wow, I only had this much, but now together we can do so much more. That's the impact we can have. I've heard it said that if you want to go fast, go alone. That makes sense. But if you want to go far, go together. And I believe that is true coming out of a statement like this, that two are better for one because they have a good return for their labor. We can have impact. Number two is help. Verse 10 says, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. No matter what part of the human experience you consider, uh, this is true. Relationships uh, will fall apart from time to time. Jobs fall apart from time to time. Uh, we experience injury and sickness in the physical realm. Things fall apart from time to time. We all fall. Uh, even in our spiritual lives, you give in to temptation, and we experience the impact of our selfishness and our sin, and we fall. In every one of those situations, when we fall, we need to be helped up. And this verse is saying if someone falls down and they're alone, pity that person. But boy, if they're with somebody and you suffer a setback, because of something you've experienced or um, something that was done to you or something that you chose, either way, but you experience a devastating fall and people are around you, they can pick you up. They can encourage you. They can see when you're down. And they can say, hey, can we have a moment? Can we talk for just a minute? You can read it on someone's face, right? And you can stop and say, I see you. I've got you. This fall isn't final and the fall isn't fatal. We move on because people pick us up. Pity the one who doesn't have anyone to pick them up. 
There was a, a story in the news in 2006 officials in the United Kingdom were trying to, to, to collect rent. Uh, a lady had fallen way behind on her rent in her apartment. And in 2006, they, they made calls. They tried to visit. They couldn't get a hold of her. And so after many uh, reaching out and, and getting no answers, they, the police went and knocked on her door. Couldn't, they, they made their way in. They found out that she had uh, died in, in her apartment. And this was in January of 2006. The autopsy showed that she had died in December of 2003. I know. Her name was Joyce Carol Vincent. She was 38 years old. She was 38. She died holding a bag that had at one point held her groceries. Uh, Her body had naturally decomposed to the point where they couldn't tell exactly how she died. They knew she had asthma, that perhaps there was an asthma attack. They knew she lived alone. Perhaps she had fallen and hurt herself and couldn't get up. It is sad that Joyce died. It is absolutely tragic that Joyce was not missed for two to three years. We can find ourselves on either side of that, living alone to the point where when we fall, not if, when we fall, we have no one to help us up, and it can, in fact, be fatal. Or we can be the type of people on the other side looking constantly. Start here in this community, then expand it to your street, your neighborhood. Expand it to your school. Expand it to the people that God has put around you and say, is there anyone like Joyce out there? Who, who do I see? Because we can get so wrapped up in what's right in front of us that we can lose the, uh, we can forget the obligation and the opportunity we have to be light to somebody else and make sure there are no Joyces in this community. There are no uh, Joyces in the community where you work or live or go to school. Why? Not because people don't get lonely. They do, but because we refuse to let people drift into isolation to the point where if they fall, it is in fact fatal. Pity the one who falls and has no one to help them up. Number three, comfort. Verse 11 says this, also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Whether literal or figurative, there is absolutely a warmth of comfort in companionship, of someone knowing who you are. I have heard, and maybe you can finish this phrase, uh, the sweetest sound to the human ear is the sound of one's own name. It feels good when someone knows your name. When you walk into a big room and you hear someone call out, hey, Mark, you're here. This is a big room, and I don't know all of your names, even, even some that have been here a very long time, and I, I struggle with that. And, and sometimes I've said this to a lot of you. Hey, I'm so sorry. I, I just, I, I've, I've, I've forgotten your name. And it's not disrespect, but I, I don't want to go another day without knowing it. And, and I hope that you not only will grant me that grace, but grant that to each other. Ask someone their name. I, I'm so sorry. I forgot. There's a lot of people, right? Does anyone here know everybody? (laughs) No, probably not. Probably not. And we need to give each other grace because there's power in speaking someone's name to them. I see you. I know you. I remember you. It's encouraging. It makes you feel seen and valuable. There is a warmth of comfort in there. That's a figurative sense. There's um, also the the physical sense of warmth, of being around people. Uh, My last year of college, I found myself three credits shy of graduating my last semester, and I had to add a final class. And so I uh, went to my advisor, whatever they had needed, add a class. And they said, well, you're a youth ministry uh, major. You want to add study of the New Testament epistles, Old Testament, wisdom literature. Um, And I said, I'm kind of looking to coast this one out. Is there anything else? They said, we got a hiking class. And I said, sign me up. I did a hiking class. We met once over lunch because the professor said, hey, you don't hike in a classroom, so we're not going to meet in a classroom. I said, I love this class. And so I took a hiking class. The only assignment was to read a book about hiking and to go on a hike. And I'm like, this is the easiest. This is great. I live in Indiana. I'm going to school in Marion. Flat, baby. This is going to be awesome. He said, well, actually, it needs to be somewhere a little more challenging, and it needs to be 26.2 miles. I said, okay. So I called uh, three of my friends from Fort Wayne who I'd gone to high school with, and we went on a hike to wrap up my college career in the southern uh, tip of Indiana at the, on the Knobstone Trail. Knobstone Trail, you can actually see it's very, very um, 
very southern tip, you can see the Louisville skyline from a couple of the high points. You're nodding. Have you been there? Have you been there? Are you just, okay, it's beautiful. People use the train for the Appalachian Trail. It's gorgeous. But, but although people train for these type of things, we were all 21, 22-year-old males, so obviously we didn't need any training. Uh, so we didn't. We did not train at all. I had them come up to Marion. They came up, uh, I think, a Friday night, and um, we played Mario Kart until 11.30, True story. And then we said, we probably need some supplies. We had rented backpacks and tents. We said, we need some supplies. So we went to Walmart. And we bought tons of beef jerky and trail mix and a couple cans of food. Didn't bring a can opener. So just a tip if you're going out. Um, and then we stayed up late doing that. And then the next morning, we drove to the southern tip of Indiana and started our hike. We hiked 13.1 miles in. Um, it, was, it was pretty tough. It was one of the harder things I've done in my life for sure. We set up a tent, and it began to get very cold. During the day, it was, it was, it was March in Indiana. You know, it was under 30 degrees. It was snowing while we were hiking, but you're, 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 you're using your body so much, you're burning a massive amount of calories. It feels great. It feels brisk. We felt alive until we stopped, and the sun disappeared, and we started to freeze. We built a blazing fire, and we got so close to it. I remember, like, we're, it's singeing our jackets, Right? And, and yet, although it's singeing my jacket, I could feel no warmth. And I thought, this is going to be a problem. We had four guys in two tents, and we said goodnight and, and, and said, well, this is going to be a cold one. And we lay down, and I'm just, we're just shaking and shivering. And, and as the temperature continued to drop overnight, so did the distance between me and my tent mate and me and my tent mate. And we got very, very close that night. And so I'm telling you, not only is there warmth in, in companionship, there is warmth in comfort. We need this. There's a physical warmth. There's a relational warmth when people know your name. Um, and I was never, he told me, he said, don't ever tell anyone about this night. And now I have <laughs> in front of all of you. So I apologize to my friend who won't be named. Number four, strength. Verse 12a, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. Simply two are stronger than one. No need to go into this one too deep. But isn't it good to know that someone has your back? I hope you don't get in a physical altercation. I hope we don't have fighters in here, right? We're, we're Jesus-loving people. We, we, we bend our knee to the Prince of Peace. But boy, if you're in a fight, wouldn't it be good to know someone has your back? Wouldn't it be good to know if someone is saying something about you and you're not present, that they step in to correct that? Even if the thing being said about you is true, isn't it good that you have a friend that'll say, no, you're not going to say that about them? When they're not here, we need people to have our back. We can defend ourselves when we are surrounded with community. Now, the, the last one, five, our bonus, the third strand, uh, verse 12b, where we started will end. The cord of three strands is not quickly broken. It's, again, he's referring simply, straightforward, to strength in numbers. But I noticed something unique in here. Throughout this whole passage, these, these, these 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, we, we over and over see the number two. Two are better than one. Uh, two are better than one. And um, if two lie down, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. Why do we jump to three here at the end? Why does he close this thought with the number three? He hasn't addressed three at all yet, and yet in this moment he says there's a cord of three strands. One, because he's probably, again, just referring to the more the better. The more people in the community, the better. It's good to have a, a greater size community, but more subtly, it's an allusion to our triune God. When we have a unity rope at a wedding, those three ropes, I will always explain, this rope signifies the life of the groom, and this rope or cord strand signifi signifies the life of the bride, and this one in the middle is God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And when those three cords are interwoven together, there's a strength in that that can't be broken. Whatever your community looks like, it will be its strongest only when God is woven into the center of that relationship. Today we have our community group signups out there, as I've mentioned many times, and this was not coincidental that I'm preaching on this. It is my hope that you will prayerfully consider taking a step into a community group. And if it's not a community group, it's somewhere else. The two questions I want you to think about as we wrap up is simply this. Am I moving closer to or further from God? 
and related, am I moving closer to right now or further from community? Typically, you're not going to have different answers. If you are moving closer to God, the hope is that he's drawing you closer into community. And if you find yourself, so, you know, I feel like I'm moving further from God right now. I bet you also find yourself moving further from community. But if you move into community, you will move into this relationship that God has designed us to have, which is doing life together. I don't know how you'll take that step. I hope that you will. We mentioned community groups. I hope a lot of you today, you're not going to make anybody feel better. I hope you don't go through that door. I hope you go through that door, at least just so I can see you do it, and then you can just zip around, do whatever you want. But, but I hope we have a little bit of a jam over there that you'll at least walk over there and go, you know what? There's eight or nine groups. They all have open seats. I've never done this. It makes me a little bit uncomfortable. I'm a bit of an introvert. I don't like people, but gosh, if God's created me to have this need, maybe it'll benefit me. Maybe the walking towards community will, in fact, help me come, become closer to God. If it's not a community group, maybe it's a ministry team. We have 20-plus ministry teams in this church coffee team, custodial team, kids ministry, youth ministry, our worship team. We talked about this last week. Maybe you'll find your life together with someone else while you serve. For those in high school, middle school and high school, uh, tonight, 6.30, we have our high school youth group, 6.30 to 8. We gather, there's uh, snacks and some games, there's teaching from the Bible, then a conversation, a discussion about how you as high schoolers can grow in your faith. Wednesday night, junior high, middle school, same time, 6.30 to 8. We meet, come in the main doors, head over to the student room. Same idea. We're gathering together around people so that we can find community. We can find life together. We have been created to one another very well. Andy Stanley says this about the the, the early church. He says, the primary activity of the early church was one anothering one another. And I love this because a lot of what we do, and this is okay, but a lot of what we do is what we're doing right now. Preaching, teaching, teaching that came after a time of worship through singing. But are we one anothering? Go read the New Testament. Go read the book of Acts. You will find teaching and preaching. You will find praise and prayer. But more than that, you will find instances of people loving each other, serving each other, forgiving one another, helping one another up when they fall, challenging one another, holding one another to a high, high standard. The one anothering was the highest regarded part of church life in the early church? Are you moving closer to or further away from the community God has called you to embrace? I'll, I'll close with this quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, Life Together. Uh, John and the banner come up and close us in a song. In Life Together, Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes this, the companionship of a fellow Christian is a physical sign of the gracious presence of our triune God. The companionship of a fellow Christian is the physical sign of the gracious presence of our triune God. I I know we believe in Jesus. We we hold that truth to be true in our hearts, but it can be hard sometimes when you can't see him. Maybe I'll struggle with that. You can't see God. Maybe you've had an experience, a vision, an interaction. Maybe not. Thanks, Johnny. Community right there. Most of us don't see God with our eyes, but you know what we do see? The body of Christ all around us. God has put you here for such a time as this. He's he's appointed the time and the place that you would live, and that means the person to your right and left and behind you, he's appointed them to the same time and place as well. You're not here by accident, but he's here so that we might lean into his presence, and we find his presence most powerfully displayed in the community that he's called us into. So I hope you'll take that step today. Let me pray for us today as we prepare to close in a song of worship. Jesus, thank you for the opportunity we have, oh, not just to be part of a group that we can hide in the back and not really be known, but would you help us get to know others? Would you help us be known? Would you help us put our guard down a little bit? Even when it's hard, even when it's uncomfortable at times, though we may be introverted or unsure or too new, may we take that step and ask someone their name, introduce ourselves, sign up for a group, join a ministry team to serve, begin to find this community that you've displayed in your own 
triune existence, but you've called us into as well. Thank you that you call us to be more together than we ever could alone. It's in your name we pray. Amen.